What's up guys? Welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Ordell. Today's video is really for you E4 players trying to find a response against E5. And we've covered a number of different openings on this channel, right? The Vienna game, Gilco Piano, Italian game, Gilco Pianissimo, the Danish. I mean, there's a ton of different options. But guys, today's video is a very rare option that a lot of people don't know about. And it's called the Goring Gambit. And it actually leads to some pretty fun chess. We're starting out with Knight F3. And now against knight c6, we're breaking open the center with d4 with the scotch game. There's a lot of different things that black can try to do here, but the best move, and it's not even close, is black simply just snatching off this pawn. And against this, we're actually not going to go into the main line of the scotch game or even the scotch gambit, but instead play c3, reaching the goring gambit, offering up a second pawn and looking to take towards the center of the board if black refuses to move that deep on. There's a bunch of different things that black can try to do here, and we're gonna be covering them in detail. First off, what to do if black here tries something like D3, right? Just going like, I don't want the smoke, I'm just gonna give you a pawn and go from there, trying to reach a more closed type position. We're also gonna be looking at this move of D takes C3, which is the most popular option online here, black accepting the gambit, and finally this move of D5, one of the declined variations, putting some pressure on e4 let's first take a look at this move of d3 black just handing back a pawn and simply not trying to open up this position too much well guys in this case the game's actually really simple for us we're going to play this move of bishop captures on d3 notice the edge in development that we currently have as we are only one move away from castle and kingside if we see a move like d6 i kind of like playing h3 just to prevent this bishop from ever even thinking about coming to g4 and if you see a move here like knight f6 we can castle kingside and I mean, look, there's a ton of different things that we can do. We can just continue to naturally develop our pieces. Knight d4 is actually a pretty nice option. And one of the main ideas behind this is that at some point, we're able to play this move of f4, right? Expanding on the king side, really trying to wipe out half of the fifth rank and put some pressure on black. We have very easy development on the way, moves like b3, bishop b2, queen f3 ideas as well. And if black ever tries to take on d4, we're simply gonna capture back. Now not covering just four squares, but five squares on the fifth rank. And it's gonna be very hard for black to try to make any kind of counterplay. If you ever see a move like c5, we have d5 options available, taking up more space. If you see d5, we have e5 options available, kicking around this knight. And in this case, I mean, if d5 is played, e5, knight d7 is going to be forced. That is not looking good for black. e5 ideas are in the works for white. A definite possibility every single move we play. And I'm taking white here any day of the week. So y'all, that covers this move of d3. Here, black just handing back a pawn. But again, it makes the game very easy for us. We're simply going to play a move like bishop captures back, castle on king's side, knight d4, start looking at f4 ideas. And we're going to be playing very aggressive and attacking chess with a nice base advantage, right? What happens here if black accepts the gambit by playing this move of d takes c3? We as white here actually have a choice. One of them is playing the double pawn sacrifice variation with bishop c4, but in today's video, we're going to be spending most of our time in the main line, which is simply capturing back with this knight. Guys, taking back with the knight, putting some pressure on d5. In this position, we're down a pawn, but we do have an edge in development, and development is going to continue to come very easily here let's say black plays a move like bishop b4 okay this is a very popular option online here black trying to pin the knight on c3 to our king in this case we can just continue with a move like bishop c4 putting some pressure on this pawn on f7 which by the way is the weakest pawn in chess because only the king defends it and now black has a couple of different routes that they usually take one of them is taking on c3 and then playing a quiet move like d6 the other one is just kind of throwing this knight right into the action with knight f6 and in that case i personally really like playing e5 kicking this knight around there's a ton of different ways that black can really almost lose this game on the spot i mean one of them is just playing this move of knight e4 look this move looks very active putting some pressure on c3 trying to trade down but all of a sudden we play this move of queen d5 and we're threatening both the knight and a mate in one black here can try to stall things by you know playing a move like bishop takes c3 with check but we're simply going to take back and the threat remains black here simply cannot stop both going back to this move of e5 if we also see a move here like queen e7 this may seem strong right i mean this queen trying to pin this pawn to the king on e1 but in that case we don't really care we're just going to continue by castling kingside and all of a sudden this knight is gonna have to run out of the way if that happens we have knight d5 options available attacking the queen and here if black decides to take the pawn on e5 we'll simply capture back and all of a sudden it's black who is losing their queen as it cannot get out of the way as is pinned to that king on e8 this position is resignable for black
CL again in this line, in which case we take on C3 and we see bishop B4 followed by knight F6. We're going to push with E5. There's a ton of different ways that black can fall into trouble very quickly there. I mean, we cover knight E4, queen E7. Even if this move of knight G4 is played, we have bishop takes F7 with check and knight G5 check ideas attacking the king and simply picking off that knight on g4 however y'all the main line here the best move for black is d5 and it's not close so i actually recommend that you memorize this line this is the main line in the goring gambit and if someone is black if an e5 player is black is playing against you and they've really studied the theory behind the goring gambit which honestly i don't think is going to happen that much of the time you may see this move of d5 and the following variation so i recommend that you study this. We're going to start off with e takes f6, just snatching off this knight. And here, if they take our bishop, I actually like taking the queen right off the board. Black here can take with the king, but in that case, we have f takes g7, and you know this king is a little bit prone to attack, and it's not castled. So I think that knight takes d8 is definitely the way to go. And even then, we're still going to take on g7, attacking that rook on h8. And the moment that it moves, we're going to defend this pawn on g7 which by the way i mean is only one step away from promotion usually here black will try to play something like knight e6 and attack the pawn and no we can't save this pawn on g7 but we can get a big edge in development here we're going to castle queenside we're looking at potential knight d5 ideas so here much of the time black will try to trade off that knight which is the most accurate move according to the computer but in that case we're simply going to capture back and even if black does try to go up a pawn here we have rook h e1 with check. Notice the amount of pressure that we're putting on the black camp. And all that black has to show for it is a single pawn. I mean, here, if we see a move like 96, we can actually continue with g3 and really try to continue putting the pressure on black. A couple of ideas include rook d4, looking to just snatch off that pawn on c4. Notice how this knight cannot move as it's pinned to the king on e8. And another idea is playing something like knight e5, really active minor piece. And on top of that, again, just looking to snatch off that pawn on c4. It's going to be hard for black to hold on to this thing. So y'all, if you see a move like 96, we have g3 followed by rook d4 or knight e5 ideas, both of which looking to capture off that pawn. What about this move of bishop e6? Well, in this case, white is actually much better after rook d5, looking to play rook g5, pinning this knight to the rook on g8. And there's absolutely nothing black can do about it. Notice that this knight cannot move without simply being lost. I mean, if you, I mean, look, if you move the knight to h5, we're just going to take it off. If you move it to f5, we're still going to win this knight as this bishop cannot move. And the very next move, guys, let's say black plays something here like rook d8. We're going to play rook g5, pinning it to the rook on g8. And here, if we see king f8, let's continue to put the pressure on black. We have knight d4, remember, continue to put the pressure on black. Yes, we are technically in an endgame type position with a queen off the board and two minor pieces as well. But that being said, guys, I mean, we have a ton of pressure on the black camp. Black here with a very awkward position. It's hard for them to even move if here they play the best option, which is rook d6. We have a couple of different ideas. One of them is playing this move of knight b5, attacking both the rook and the pawn on c7. And another idea is just playing rook ge5, right? Forming a battery ram and putting even more pressure on this bishop on e6. Black can lose this game very quickly if they're not careful. And here is white. We have a nearly plus two evaluation according to the computer. So y'all going back to this position, in which case we see the move of bishop b4 and we continue with bishop c4 ourselves. If you do see this move of knight f6, simply continue with e5. There's a ton of different ways that black can get a loss game very quickly there. But if they do know the main line, which is d5, we can take on f6, take on g7, defend that pawn on g7 following the capturing of that queen again memorize that line and you're going to be in business it's just very hard for black to navigate that without giving something up what about the second option that we often see in online and over the board chess bishop takes c3 followed by the very quiet move of d6 here black just trying to trade down and not trying to do anything crazy we hear guys i mean we do have some options one of them is this move of castling king side but the computer really likes this move of knight g5 and it does perform very well in online chess. Really what this does is force black to play a very awkward move like knight h6, defending the pawn on f7, or play this move of knight e5, right? Which does two things. First off, it defends the pawn on f7, but it also puts some pressure on our bishop on c4. But if we see this, we're now going to play bishop b3. We're wanting to play f4, kicking this knight away from the defense of that pawn on f7, and then obviously take that pawn right off and potentially get a fork against the queen and the rook. So much of the time you're going to see black here play h6, right? Going, look, I want your knight to run away, but guys, we're not going to move this knight at all. In fact, we're just going to continue with our f4 plan. Whole idea being, if you move your knight, thank you for the pawn on f7. And if you take our knight, thank you for yours. Again, a ton of landmines 
that black can fall into here. One of them is just taking off the pawn on e5, right? I mean, why wouldn't black just go up two pawns? Well, now we have bishop takes f7 with check, right? Obviously, if you take this bishop, we just win your queen on d8. And if you try to hold on to the queen, we're not going to take on g5 because of knight f6, but instead play this move of bishop a3. Guys, this king has no choice but to take on f7 or play a move like queen d6. In any case, we're simply going to go up a ton of material. You'll yet again, a crushing position there for white. See, so all going back to this, it's a very hard position for black to navigate. I mean, they can't even take the pawn on e5 because the bishop takes f7. We have castling kingside ideas in the air, putting even more pressure on that very weak pawn. And we're also putting pressure on g5 at the moment. The best move here for black is queen e7. This is the one move that gives black a very tiny edge, according to the computer. But even then, from a practical standpoint, I personally would much rather have white following queen d5, putting some pressure on f7 i mean look you want to play something like bishop e6 we'll take on b7 attacking your rook on a8 you want to play something like knight h6 we can take on d6 and get even more activity and eyes on that pawn on g5 and here if you play a move like d takes e5 we're simply able to play bishop a4 with check surprisingly bishop d7 is actually black's best move here in which case we're going to continue with queen takes b7 and we have a nearly even game but guys, anything else, and black has the clear edge. First off, if a move like c6, we can actually just take that thing right off. The whole idea being we're going to check that king and then pick off this rook a move later. If they decide not to play c6, but instead go with this move of king f8, at first sight, this seems like a very solid option. I mean, right now, black is simply up two pawns of material. They have a move like knight f6 on the way. But guys, we throw in this move of bishop a3. It's the only move here. That gives white a better position, but if we do play this, white is completely winning. We're looking at this queen and we're going, look, if you don't move, I'm going to take you, and if you do take me, I'm simply going to play queen d8, checkmate, game over. So y'all going back to this key position, in which case black accepts the Goring Gambit. We can just take back with the knight, be down one pawn, continue with moves like bishop c4, and have great attacking options and ideas available. A ton of landmines that black can fall into, especially if you memorize the chess opening theory. But guys, we don't necessarily have to take this pawn on c3. And I just wanted to mention that really quickly in this video. We could actually continue with this move of bishop c4, a double pawn sacrifice variation. Let me know if you guys want me to make a video on this move alone. I mean, look, black doesn't have to take this pawn on b2, right? And if they don't, we're probably just going to play a move like knight takes c3 in the future anyways. But if they do take on b2, we now take back with the bishop. We're down two pawns. But talk about a monstrous bishop pair. This is reminding me a ton of the Danish gambit. And I mean, here, if black plays something like bishop b4 or check, we can simply continue to naturally develop our pieces. Guys, develop, develop, develop. We are down two pawns of material. We can't sit around. We got to attack. We got to play aggressive and put as much pressure on the enemy camp as we can. See, so far in this video, following this move of c3, we've covered two moves. One of them, this move of d3, in which case we get a very simple and easy game with bishops captures back. And here, if we see the move of d takes on c3 going into the accepted line, we can either take with the knight or even go into that double pawn sacrifice line with bishop c4, although most players highly prefer just taking with the knight and only being down one pawn. Guys, what happens here if black goes into the declined line of d5, right? Just expanding in the center of the board and putting some pressure on e4. Well, most players here play this idea of e takes d5. This is what you're gonna see most of the time. Whole idea being after queen takes d5, we're now gonna take on d4, but I personally am not a big fan of this line for white. Some players here actually like having an isolated pawn in the center of the board, but I think that this pawn is too big of a target. In fact, here black could play a move like bishop g4, pinning our knight to the queen on d1. And here if we play a move like bishop e2, black can continue to put on the pressure with moves like bishop b4 or check, taking on f3, and then continuing with queen c4. This is the main line for black, putting pressure on c3, putting pressure on d4 as well. I just don't see why white would ever want a position like this. But again, this is a line that I'm not too fond of, but there are probably players out there that are comfortable with this position for white. So if that is you, there's absolutely nothing wrong with going into this line. So y'all taking a step back, this is definitely an option for white. It's not losing. In fact, you know, computers evaluate it at dead even. However, this is what black expects you to do. I instead am a big fan of this move of bishop d3, which at first sight seems kind of weak because black can just take on e4. It seems like they're just up a pawn for no good reason. But guys, the whole point here is that we're looking to attack this knight on c6. If black here plays a move like knight f6, we're simply going to snatch that thing right off the board. 
and now castle kingside. Even if black takes on c3, we now have rook e1 with check. Notice just how much we're prioritizing getting our king to safety and then getting after this king before it can even castle. Here, if we see a move like bishop e6, we have queen a4 options available, attacking that very weak pawn on c6 and continuing to pin down that bishop against that king on e8. And here if we see a move like bishop e7, one of the main options here for white is actually just taking that queen right off the board because the rook can't capture back, but now the king has to, and this king now becomes a big, big target. At this point, okay, we'll play this move of knight takes e3. We're still down a pawn, but black has some serious issues to deal with. First off, they have isolated and double isolated pawns on the queen side of the board. We're looking at knight e5 options, attacking both the pawn on c6 and this pawn on f7. And if black here plays the best move of bishop d6, they still have a lot to work through because of this move of bishop g5 pinning the knight to the king on g8. Multiple ideas here. First off, it never hurts to throw a rook move in there like rook ac1 or even rook ad1, depending on the situation, really eyeing that king on d8. We're also eyeing options such as knight e4, looking to put more pressure on f6 and the bishop on d6. We have knight d4 options attacking the pawn on c6. And notice, if we ever take this knight on f6, black is not just going to have one set of an isolated and double isolated pawns, but two sets black up a pawn but guys if you have two sets of isolated pawns and two sets of double isolated pawns it's simply going to be a very difficult and long end game ahead so we just covered this move of knight f6 in which case we're going to take this knight on c6 castle king so we're not even going to take this pawn on d4 right away we're going to try to castle king side play rookie one and put pressure on that king on e8 what else can black do here well if they take on c3 we have queen e2 and we're now threatening a mate in one. If we take on c6, there's going to be a double check, and it's not even going to be a check. It's going to be a checkmate in this current position, and if black stops this with a move like bishop e6, okay, we'll just take on c3. Going back to this move of bishop takes e4, black tries a move like queen e7 looking to pin our bishop to the king on e1. We have the common idea, guys. Don't hold on to this bishop. Don't play a move like queen e2 or knight d2 trying to hang on for dear life. Instead, just castle kingside. Look, if black wants to take that bishop, their queen is the one that's going to get pinned to that king on e8. And here, if we see a move like bishop e6, yet again, capture on c6, give black some very bad pawn structure to work with, play knight takes d4, putting pressure on both this pawn and the bishop on e6. You see something like queen d7, we have rook e1, a ton of initiative and activity for white in this game. So y'all, again, I'm a big fan of bishop d3 opposed to taking on d5. We just covered this move of d takes e4, in which case we capture back with the bishop, eyeing that knight on c6, looking to really damage black's pawn structure, play casting kingside rook e1, and keep the pressure coming. What happens if black takes on c3 instead? What do we do here? Well, I recommend this move of e takes d5. Look, I mean, if black wants to play something like queen takes d5, we'll play knight takes e3, castling kingside, we're going to be in business. If a move here like c takes b2, we're going to take back with the bishop because obviously we don't want to have black have two queens in a position like that or really ever. And here if black plays queen takes d5 in response, we can now castle kingside. We're down two pawns, but yet again, a ton of initiative and activity in the goring gambit. I mean, even if black tries to play active here, let's say they play a move like bishop g4, really trying to put some pressure on our knight. Okay, let's just play this move of rook e1 with check. Notice here bishop e7 can't be played without them just losing this pawn on g7 so that's definitely not the way to go and here if we see this move of knight g e7 we now have this option of knight c3 right attacking the queen and y'all here if we see a move like queen d7 we're then going to respond with bishop e4 again a key idea in the goring gambit putting some pressure on the knight on c6 if we see a move again like castling queenside we have queen b3 so putting some pressure on b7 f7 we got rook a d1 ideas in the air very fun game to play with going forward and going back to this bishop e4 move however some of you may be wondering wait a second we're attacking why would we ever give black the opportunity to simply trade down queens well guys here we take back with the rook and even though there are queens off the board we are still playing very aggressive and attacking chess notice how black simply cannot castle queenside here at the moment we're eyeing ideas like knight d5 or knight b5 both of which are putting some pressure on c7 even if black starts to try to trade down with the move like bishop takes f3 this actually turns out to be a big mistake which gives us a plus to advantage because we simply take back and all of a sudden we have that much more pressure on black black tries to play something like rook d8 here looking to trade down i mean they are up two points of material we're now going to play knight d5 right whole idea being that this knight can't move and if the rook captures back we're going to go up the exchange and guys if this rook tries to go back to a square like c8 we play bishop g4 and y'all f5 does absolutely nothing because we're simply going to snatch it off the board and this knight still cannot move we have simply too much pressure on black in this position and we're going to win this game very quickly if we end up pulling it out the right way 
And y'all here, if black tries to play something like rook c8, hanging on to the pawn on c7, we got bishop g4 locked and ready to go, right? Attacking that rook, and y'all, f5 does absolutely nothing. We're simply going to snatch it off the board, and yet again, this knight cannot move. We simply have too much pressure on the black camp here. I mean, with this bishop on f5, this knight on d5, very active minor piece. This bishop on b2, pouncing all the way down to g7 and h8 if this pawn ever moves. And two rooks right in the center of the board. A completely one game for white coming out of the Goring Gambit. So y'all, we finally take a step back in this position. If black wants to play something like d3, simply capture it off. We got an easy game. If they take on c3, you have the option of going into the main line with knight takes c3 or going into the double pawn sacrifice variation with the bishop c4. And finally, if you see this move of d5, you can take on d5 or if you want, or you can go with my personal option of bishop d3 defending the pawn on e4 and keeping some tension and sacrificial ideas going forward in this game. Guys, there's one more move, and that is this idea of knight f6, but this actually transposes into the pawn d on e opening, in which case we're going to play this move of e5. If you want to learn more about this variation in particular, I'm going to leave a link to my Ponziani video at the end. Once you hit that Ponziani video, simply skip over to 11 minutes and 40 seconds. You're going to reach this exact position, and I cover this position in detail as the Ponziani opening and the Goring Gambit overlap. Thank you guys for watching today's video, and special thanks to everyone who has become a patron. My goal is to make this chess thing go full-time, and y'all are helping me create better chess content and drop it more often. If you'd like to check out that Ponziani opening video, which I mentioned, click that video to the left. If you want to learn more about the hippopotamus defense as a whole, click that playlist to the right. Leave a comment down below to let me know other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel, and as always, I appreciate y'all. Thanks for watching. Peace.